Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our continuing series of science uh, sharing seminars. Uh, today, I'm happy to introduce uh, Ken Cook, the Sioux at uh, WFO Wichita, and he's going to talk a little bit about the use of dual polarization radar and their uh, experiences and perspectives from an operational side in the IBW, which all of you are probably very familiar with now. So, uh, Ken, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, John. And uh, uh, just kind of uh, to reiterate what John said, I, I did want to, I know this case has probably been beat to death, but uh, I just wanted to show like kind of what our office went through during this scenario. It was very interesting, uh, you know, the, the, it came close to the offices type of thing. Just to show how the whole uh, marrying of dual pole radar and what we can see uh, into this impact-based warnings uh, so-called experiment or what have you that we're doing. So that's the uh, motivation for this talk, and that's primarily what I'm going to talk about. Uh, during that outbreak, we had 24 total tornado tracks, and the uh, the two I'm going to focus on is the one up here that occurred southwest of Salina uh, that you see here in the red circle, and that was where the EF4 occurred in our forecast area. And then uh, the second one I'll discuss is this one down here at the south part of our forecast area that ended up striking Wichita. Uh, this is a long-lived supercell as well that came up out of Oklahoma. So these are the two that I'm going to focus on during this talk. The first one I'll discuss is the one here in Salina. And uh, I know it's uh, you know a loop here of what's going on. You probably can't see it because of the bandwidth. But this basically just gives you a uh, kind of an overview of how the supercell was going here in uh, central Kansas and the track that it took down here from near Lyons up uh, to near Salina. And there's uh, Canopolis Lake is in here too, so um, it did strike near there. Uh, as far as the central Kansas uh, EF4, um, this is what the SRM looked like um, leading up to that uh, when we got the reports and went out and surveyed the damage. And again, here it is, uh, northeast of Lyons at this time. And then uh, over here on the right, it was further uh, away. So you can see there's a very strong meso there. You're looking at um, about 90, 80 to 90 knots inbound and, and just about likewise outbound. Uh, on your screen now is some of the, uh, the, the uh, imagery of what we went up. It did strike a house, a farmstead there. And in your upper left, you can see a lot of the scouring there, the trees, and the lower right here, or the lower left, sorry, is what's left of the home. The entire uh, foundation, or the, everything but the foundation in this little stairwell was gone off of the house. Um, in, the, in the lower right here, if you look in the, the dirt road, there's a little bit of a ridge there. That's actually where the, uh, the, the, all the sand and dirt um, toward you, if you will, was scoured away at a depth of about five inches, five to six inches deep uh, from the tornado. And above that is the, uh, this is what was left of a tree. It was completely debarked. And what's coating the tree is the mud and dirt from the uh, picture below of, of the dirt road. So, and you can see some of that uh, to the left here of the tree as well. It's a pretty powerful storm. Um, this is kind of the uh, aerial shot of the house that was struck right down here along Avenue W, uh, if you could see my cursor. And uh, so just a, it was very interesting, some of the decisions that were made uh, during the, uh, the, this experiment. Um, the, the residents here, uh, they looked to their southwest, saw that a tornado was coming. They saw something close to this. This is a picture taken um, not far from their home of the tornado approaching them. They realized the tornado was coming, so the decision that they made was there was plenty of time. They got in their car, and they actually drove down here to this 29th road here and watched the tornado actually decimate their home. And then they came back to it and realized, you know, the whole thing was gone. So it was very interesting dis uh, decision-making by uh, this individual family. And, uh, again, this is what some of the aftermath was. And they... Uh, they did live through it, so they made the right to decision, and uh, you know they survived. And I don't think if they were if they were hiding in their home at this time uh, when this came over, they they more than likely have been uh, at least injured, if not uh, killed, in this situation. So, uh, you know, did the warnings that we issue with the enhanced statements uh, do anything for that? That's that's uh, it was very interesting to uh, discuss that. So here's a look at the dual pole data. 
Um, you can see here the reflectivity um, here on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, you can see there's a debris ball there, or what looks to be one. And with this this part of the case, this is a GR data, so it's it's the unfiltered that you get. Um, so here in the ZDR, right here in the uh, what would be identified as the meso with the GR algorithm, uh, there's a ZDR below zero, and that is uh, you know, the coalition correlation coefficient at 0 0.5 degrees is very low in the 0.4 range. So we could deduce here that that is debris, and uh, then we looked at about 15,000 feet, and we do still have the same correlation coefficient signature. So this debris is being lofted very high, very large volume of it. Uh, so from that and from some of the research that they've done down at Nestle, uh, you can suppose that this is a pretty powerful storm, a pretty significant tornado going on. So um, you know, just from that standpoint, Using some of that information, we were able to, uh, at least our forecasters were able to during this event, be able to put that information in their warnings uh, to give people kind of a better uh, represent, representation of what's going on. We were getting a lot of uh, storm chase reports in that, and I'll go through that here with the second case I'm going to talk about here, um, which is the one that was coming up out of uh, Wichita, or up out of Oklahoma. So here just to, uh, again, you know, I put a loop in here, and I understand the bandwidth. If you download the presentation, you can look at this loop. It's pretty fascinating. Um, this is just the cyclic process that's, that we were observing as it was coming through uh, northern Oklahoma. It was occluding about every 20 minutes. So uh, again, I'll just let this run through. If you can somehow see a few frames, maybe get what I mean. But I would encourage you to, to talk to John or myself, and I can share the presentation uh, with you, and you can, you can look at some of these loops. So uh, as we um, go into the next, boy, I'm really slow here. What we're going to see now is a combination of uh, GR images and what was happening as uh, things transpired with AWIPS here. And the reason I have GR imagery is because I can replot the polygons of what was going on here. So initially here at about uh, 1Z, we issued our first tornado warning. It was located down just... Uh, northwest of Cherokee, Oklahoma. Um, and so this is moving to the northeast. It's pretty straightforward. It had uh, it was a long-lived supercell with long track tornadoes associated with it um, at this time. And so what the first thing we did basically is we went with an observed significant tag with this storm based upon the several reports and chase reports of upstream tornadoes, large wedge, stovepipe tornado. We get a lot of that uh, during this event. So here's the first uh, image as it passed into uh, Kansas, uh, just northwest of Manchester, Oklahoma. Uh, very strong uh, low-level circulation here, gate-to-gate -gate here. A nice debris ball on it and the reflectivity in your upper left. And then in your upper right here, you can see very low ZDR, uh, slightly negative, or near zero, slightly negative. And a nice correlation coefficient minimum here of down around 0.2 to 0.4. So, very, uh, very indicative of a debris ball here using dual pole data. And I'm now going to go volume scan by volume scan uh, using the. Um, oh golly, just went out of my mind. The uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on the storm. Basically, it's the relative motion of the storm. And our first number of uh, imagery is going to be from Vance Air Force Base, and then we'll switch over to the Wichita radar. Um, hopefully, it's somewhat seamless. As we go to our next uh, image here very slowly. <clears throat> about 45 minutes later, because again we issued a, a tornado warning with a lead time of about 45 minutes entering the state, about 40 minutes. Um, we issued another warning, uh, seemed to be going more to the east, and so we issued one here uh, at 145Z uh, with an observed significant tag. Um, and then here's the uh, imagery there, the next imagery we have here. Very, very strong low-level circulation, uh, well-defined debris ball, and all the dual pole and uh, uh, reflectivity um, imagery here. Um, at this time, we are receiving a report at uh, 149Z of wedge tornado crossed into the Kansas, and we had power lines down um, with this storm. Um, then the next volume scan came in. It was basically about the same. Um, again, uh, what I want to also direct your attention a, a, on is the ZDR, which is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. 
there's some very interesting things that we observed during this event, which I'm going to point out as we go along. So we'll look at the next volume scan here. Uh, again, you can still see the debris ball here uh, northwest of Bluff City or southeast of Anthony, right there in the middle between those two. Very strong meso down here in the SRM. And uh, again, you can see correlation coefficient agrees with uh, what we're seeing in uh, ZDR here with the debris ball. But <clears throat> if you notice, there's a second area here of near zero ZDR and uh, correlation coefficients kind of taking a dive out here. And as we uh, go on to our next uh, thing here, watch that. So at, at 9 o'clock or 2Z, we received uh, more reports of tornado to the, uh, you know, they're spotting tornado to the north down here at uh, uh, 3 south of Antelope is down in here. A um, lot of uh, reports of tornadoes from spotters, law enforcement, hammer operators, multi-vortex multi tornado, you can see that on your screen. So we're getting a lot of these reports of large wedge, multi-vortex type of thing as we're going along. Um, here's the next volume scan. Uh, it's starting to occlude. We're starting to get the new circulation out here. And this is out here um, where the secondary area, if I go back to our last one, of uh, low ZDR is. So we've been trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, again, uh, that's actually pretty close to where the new um, TBS is going to be um, with the new uh, TBS developing out here north, uh, northeast of Bluff City. And it's also um, <clears throat> the same place where there's a minimum in uh, correlation coefficient. So very interesting things that we got to see in this data. Again, here's the next uh, volume scan. The uh, storm is occluding further. We have a second tornado already being reported out here in this area, uh, southeast of Freeport. And as we go on to our next volume scan here, um, the old one is still out here just uh, west of Freeport. The new one is east of Freeport here. You can see very good indication in dual pole of near zero ZDR and low correlation coefficient. Also back where the old one is, you still get uh, low ZDRs back there along with low correlation coefficients. So there may be some debris lofted with this storm. I'm not sure if it's still on the ground at this point or, or just completely in the occlusion phase. But uh, some of the uh, reports we're getting here at 2.13Z or 9.13 p.m., Damage to a house and a barn destroyed. No injuries. This is by a chaser. Next volume scan. Uh, the uh, circulation continues to strengthen and improve in its uh, look here. Again, you still have the same dual pole uh, indicators here with uh, ZDR at or below zero and uh, very low correlation coefficient. Reflectivity still indicating a nice debris ball. <clears throat> Stove pipe tornado on the ground reported by a chaser. So at this point, we issue a warning. We still want to keep it out of Cedric County. But at this point, uh, I believe we're still dealing with all, the sirens all on or all off type of problem that we're having. Um, the sirens uh, policy now has kind of changed. They've implemented like a $2 million upgrade to them, so they're more polygon-based. But this time, we didn't want to really alert the city of Wichita um, based on what was going on. So we just kept it down Sumner County with uh, what was happening here. So this is the next warning that we had issued here at uh, 218Z. We still went with the observed significant tag based on the reports that we were getting, and mainly it was out in <clears throat> really in the middle of nowhere, um, mainly just farmland. Um, but is this, this really was amazing how it just missed Argonia. Um, Really strong debris ball here, signature in the reflectivity. Um, lots, a large volume of what we could consider debris. And uh, especially you could see these uh, agreeing again here in ZDR and, and uh, correlation coefficient. Very strong SRM here. Some of the reports that we were getting at this time were the tornado is still on the ground near uh, Highway 44 and Argonia Road. A lot of power flashes still with some of the power lines. Again, it makes another field goal here between these two towns here, just like it did back here. Um, barely missing Argoni. We did get, when they were down there doing the survey, we got um, uh, several residents that just said that they're out there basically, they could see it for miles coming, and they basically watched it pass just uh, to the east of them. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> 
So again, we're still getting these reports of wedge tornado on the ground with power flashes. The next volume scan, it's getting ready to, uh, it's heading really basically right at Conway Springs. So at this time, this is really when the forecasters really start thinking about this tornado emergency. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, seeing that it's moving there, we've had a, a large, a lot of volume of reports of stovepipe tornado, wedge tornado, half mile wide tornado, uh, really viable reports, dual pole showing that we could have a very significant tornado on the ground. Um, the decision is made at a certain point here to issue a tornado emergency for Conway Springs. Um, so uh, some of the reports that we get with this volume scan, again, very large tornado, half mile wedge on the ground, another house being destroyed. So uh, this is when they issued a new warning first for the city of Wichita included for Sedgwick County. And this was at 232Z with an observed significant tag. Then the next thing they did with this volume scan, since it was still heading toward Conway Springs, is they went ahead and upgraded to a, uh, a catastrophic here, uh, just based on the motion. And then, uh, lo and behold, as it is always fickle for forecasters, uh, it starts to occlude again and uh, basically just misses Conway Springs to the... Uh, uh, to the west with a new one forming to the east. So some of the reports that we got during this time frame was another house being destroyed uh, pretty close to town. Um, again, multi-vortex tornado, this type of thing, rain wrap tornado, this, um, pretty raw reports. So what I want to do here is go back um, and just kind of show the progression of this without all the reports on it, kind of a little quicker. Um, again, respecting the bandwidth, just to see, give you a feel of how it was for the radar operator approaching Conway Springs. I mean, it's heading right toward it if you go back here and forth. And uh, it just missed. So, I mean, I, I'm sure we'd do it again. We still had a lot of debris signature here west of, the, of town, which they did have quite a bit in the town from this thing. And uh, you got another circulation that developed just east of Conway Springs that was uh, very strong, just missing the town. Um, we did have some homes in that destroyed right around there. So uh, again, we're still getting more uh, tornado reports, stovepipe tornado with the new one. And this is heading up toward Wichita. Now, Clearwater is actually in Cedric County, which is the uh, county that Wichita is in. So just to give you kind of a base of where we're at, we're now looking at radar data from the uh, KICT radar instead of Vance. Um, at this time, we still have the, we go back down to this observed significant uh, tag for this uh, warning that's left over down here in Sumner County. We have a uh, quarter of a half mile wide tornado just east of Conway Springs reported by a chaser at this time. As we move up, um, <clears throat> We are getting closer to Sedgwick County here. Uh, the circulation isn't looking as great. We are still seeing some debris, perhaps signature here south of Clearwater. But uh, you can see that's minimizing. The organization is becoming poorer. Um, we still get a report of a tornado, but that was the last tornado report for a while. <clears throat> if I could zoom out with this data, and I, and I can't obviously because I'm not an AWIPS, this actually, at this time, this storm is approaching the office. And so they did start coordinating with Topeka about backup, what are we going to do, different scenarios uh, as far as sheltering here. We did have the Weather Channel here for a good while. They're still here um, interviewing people at the office and in, in, in our operations, and we can discuss that later, I'm sure. That's a hot topic. It always is. So we've got this, this tornado reported, and then they have it lifted here just south of Clearwater. Um, at 10 o'clock, just after 10. And then so it's approaching, and this, this down here, Hayesville, is right here, and then this white area here is the outline, the urban outline of the city of Wichita. The, uh, the office is, is uh, if you look at the SRM, would be right up in here, where I am in the reflectivity with respect to the SRM. So it's, it's getting close to the office. They did decide to shelter here, um, and at 10.09, Topeka did take over for us and they started issuing warnings. Weather Channel crew sheltered with us in, the, in our shelter, and we had a 70-mile-an-hour wind gust, gusting clear water uh, just after that. 
So at this time, we still have this warning for uh, Cedric County. It was reissued and it was extended because uh, it was about to expire. We did go uh, observe significant at this point. That was the last warning we issued until we took back over for Topeka. Um, at this time, just going through some of the uh, uh, the radar pictures here, it started tracking toward the uh, at least where the hook is here was tracking toward Hayesville. Just missed the airport to the south. There's not, you know, this really this area here isn't really co-located with where the precipitation would be in the SRM here. So at this time, we don't believe there's any debris here. Although we did get a tornado uh, report by emergency management. Now at this time, with that report, Topeka went ahead and upgraded to a catastrophic in Wichita to the southeast part of the city, uh, which was a really good call because at this time it did uh, touch down shortly after that and uh, really did quite a bit of damage in southeast Wichita. Um, got a lot of reports, power lines and cars uh, really torn up, a lot of apartment damage, uh, power flashes, tornadoes, this type of thing. You know, you get into some city, you get in a city with some of these things, you get inundated with reports. We did add an 84, 84 mile an hour wind gust out of the north um, as the circulation passed to the south here at the airport. And then at 10.30, we took back over operations from Topeka once we realized we were safe. So they had operations for about a half hour. Things went really seamless, and it was really a testament to the coordination of both staffs and being able to uh, coordinate such a changeover. Um, at this time, the tornado is just here north of this uh, Oak Lawn area here, uh, doing a lot of damage. Uh, low, cor low correlation coefficients, so there's a lot of debris in there. Good SRM, um, and as it moved off again, it, it just continued across uh, the eastern part of Wichita. We had a 76 mile an hour wind gust at McConnell Air Force Base. A lot of damage to the airport hangars and that. I'm not going to read through each one of these, but the the worst area was hit was uh, around the Oaklawn area here, and uh, I'll go ahead and show that here a little bit to you in a minute. Um, and again, just to kind of reiterate what happens when you get into a major city. You know, the, the, it was to the point where the 911 people just actually wanted to turn their phones off because they were just getting inundated with so many calls. Um, so they in this, so they're trying to load shed some of these things like shelter information, this type of thing, off to the media. Pretty good coordination, though. Again, more tornado reports. And then here's the last tornado warning we ended up issuing for the storm for uh, the eastern part of Cedric County and into Butler, and we went back to uh, observe significant. Um, since it was uh, moving out of the area. Here's just a, um, a loop of how the whole, and I don't think you're going to be able to see this, but I'll play it anyway. Um, for the whole storm as it moved up, all right, I guess it won't. But it was a loop. I Like I said, I encourage you to look at it. And uh, this is a storm that moved up out of Oklahoma all the way through southeast Wichita. And that. it was very interesting to see the occlusion process continue time and time again, about every 20 minutes um, as it moved up through the area. So, you know, as it moved up into our area, why didn't it keep going where we didn't have as much instabilities as we did to the south? And I think if we did, we would have had this, this continuum and perhaps had an even a stronger tornado move into the southeast part of the city. <clears throat> this is kind of a revisitation of what happened down in uh, Conway Springs uh, with the two tornado paths. You can see the, uh, the, the first circulation pass within about a mile and a half of the city, and the second one passed within about, uh, oh, five to six miles east of town there. Here's the uh, the EF3 that hit southeast Wichita, illuminated by a power flash. Um, the, the tornado was a mile wide when it went through there. The thing that was very interesting there was that it, uh, as it went through, it really went in the middle of nowhere, if you will, in the middle of the city. I mean, it struck airfields. Um, a lot of the plane industry here have a lot of airfields in the southeast part of the city, and, and I'd say 60 to 70 percent of the tornado path were over those areas. If this would have been uh, to the northwest, say, by a mile, we would have struck probably an additional thirty to 50,000 people with this storm. So who knows what would have happened. So it's very fortunate for the city. Here's some of the strong inflow that preceded the storm. And this is, again, a loop. And uh, these are just uh, some winds taken off from the weather underground. And you can see here at the airport, we are getting good 40-knot winds ahead of the storm. And this, this is just a text uh, display of that. <clears throat> you can see uh, an hour before the uh, tornado 
good hour before the tornado arrived, we were getting uh, 35 gusts, almost 50 knots for a good hour beforehand. And then here's the, uh, oh, it was a southeast wind, not a north, sorry. Southeast wind uh, gusting to 73 knots as the, uh, the storm passed to the southeast. So pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff here with that. We do believe that the strong inflow was modulating, was, was a factor in how, why it was sick, uh, cycling so fast. So again, uh, this CF3 moved into South Wichita. Um, some of the things that we can discuss here about comparing this to last uh, um, things that has happened. Close call for the airport and the National Weather Service. We did have the tower evacuate. We coordinated with them quite a bit during this. They had an unmanned control tower. Um, we, this is a picture of our operations right when we were sheltering everybody out of the operations area in the shelter. Um, the airport here did observe a tornado um, pretty close to the office. Um, <clears throat> here's a westerly wind at 73 knots as well. So, um, But the one thing we wanted to stress here is that we practiced what we preached. We did take shelter. We didn't try to be heroes. Um, I guess that made us zeros. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, we did shelter, and may, we uh, I guess uh, Topeka's the heroes, so maybe George can talk about that. <laughs> we uh, looked at some of the other interesting data from this situation. Uh, we had uh, the mediagram here from uh, the McConnell Air Force Base. It was really interesting to see the, the wind gusts and some of the pressure spikes and that type of thing that occurred with this, and the wind direction changed as the storm passed. <clears throat> the pressure dropped quite substantially as the supercell approached in 30 minutes and they had a 76 mile an hour wind gust on the edge of the circulation. And comparing this to some of the more recent known outbreaks that we've had here, um, the Wichita Andover one, uh, it took kind of a similar path up through, uh, here's Clearwater here, uh, and that's sort of where this one tracked and across the southeast part of the city. Uh, remember striking the Air Force Base, base with some of the famous uh, video footage and then hitting the mobile home park. In 1991, we had 17 fatalities with it in Cedric County, and uh, 13 were in the trailer park here. Um, and all the ones over there were in manufactured housing. And then um, in 1999, we had the uh, South Wichita Hayesville uh, tornado that which which struck sort of a similar path again, which did strike the southeast part of the city, and there were six fatalities with that. Both of these had adequate lead times before the tornadoes, and there still were a lot of deaths. And the difference between uh, these storms and ours is, we, you know, we got hit again this year in 2012. We had some pretty significant damage. We had a mobile home park that was obliterated. Um, but I think the thing here is that IBW did make a difference uh, with this. There were no deaths and only a few injuries, and I can go into that here in a minute. This is the actual uh, the survey path here as it came up through uh, the south part of the city and over the Oak Lawn and, and uh, Sunview subdivisions. But then you can see a lot of this struck over. This was all over uh, Boeing and Spirit, and then all the way up here uh, into some of these fields here. It really didn't strike much except down in this area until it weakened. By the time it got up to here, it was uh, down to an EF1. So pretty amazing. Um, this is what happened in the trailer park here in the Pinair Mobile Home Park. They uh, Here's the shelter that they had built. And there were 75 people from that trailer park down or mobile home park, however you want to call it, down in the shelter. And uh, they didn't have any injuries at, in the trailer park at all. Everyone there sheltered. And the other thing that was very interesting in doing, going out and discussing uh, this event with a lot of people doing the survey, you would not believe the number of people that just were not home. A lot of people uh, heeded the forecast and warnings and just got out of town. And uh, just really a lot of, of vacant homes across the area. So. The Wichita area here, we've been affected by three significant tornado outbreaks here in the last uh, 20 or so years. And uh, they all had at least 30-minute lead times or more. And uh, this year we had no fatalities versus the other two. I mean, yeah, we had an EF3 versus uh, EF4s and 5s in the 90s. But again, we would believe that there was still a no loss of life, and it had to do a lot with the uh, learning from past tragedies, you know, the community preparedness our outreach and education efforts, and the, uh, some of the advanced awareness that we've been doing with the forecast and warnings. So really, summing it up, um, back in the Golden Spur days when that trail park got hit, uh, these uh, Ron and Barbara Moore, you can read this, but uh, I'll just discuss it. 
they believe that their 80-foot uh, mobile harm park could withstand a 65-mile-an-hour wind and uh, would likely sustain a, a weak tornado. But uh, in the mobile in the park, everyone got just obliterated. Even though there were police officers in that blaring on their loudspeakers to take shelter through the through the park, uh, they were really in shock. But a statement from the governor here um, from the last year's event was that we, he was really surprised by the just the amount of damage and no deaths. So um, he discussed the weather service and what we did here, and the citizens and the job preparing for it. And that, you know, we just all made a difference, and it's a really a testament to the uh, you know the inter integrated warning team and how that can really make a difference. So um, just to kind of summarize uh, some of the things I discussed here, um, we believe that at least we using the, the, uh, the new dual poll data in conjunction with the impact-based warnings, you can really marry the two to give your, um, you know, your customers really some good information, which we couldn't do five years ago. And you know, there's some controversy about this whole Weather Channel business, but if you're interested, there's some uh, YouTube videos that we disc that we had um, from the Weather Channel. Uh, we made uh, some, a guy DVR'd them. He made them and put them on YouTube. I include them uh, links to them in the video here that you can go ahead and uh, see them. And it's very interesting to see, you just kind of get a feel of what's going on and and how we handled the situation in here. And that went really incredibly well too, and and really helped the the Weather Service get out there. So that's really all I had. I enjoyed talking to you and. Uh, Thanks for listening to me ramble on, and uh, hope I could help you out a little bit. And if you have any questions, I'll certainly entertain them now. Well, thank you, Ken. Any questions? Hi, Ken. It's Carl in Des Moines. Hi, Carl. How you doing? Good. Thanks for the presentation. I wonder if you could elaborate a little more on that signature you're seeing in the CC and the ZDR before they cycle, if you think it's updraft or you think it's some part of the RFD you're seeing wrap around there in your dry air or something, any comments? Um, you know, we've discuss I've discussed this with Paul and uh, Jamie and all the other DTB folks, WDTB folks, and the thought is generally that it's some kind of insect diving away from it's an indication of some kind of, uh, I guess, updraft. And so the bugs to get away from the rising motion dive. So you get this um, biological signal in the CC, but in the ZDR you get this vertical, um, so you get these low negative type ZDRs that were giving you this, um, uh, you know, this, I guess, uh, shape that's more elongated in the vertical than the horizontal. That's the theory. So there's some new upward vertical motion forming there, and we're seeing some kind of a biological response to that. That's the uh, um, ongoing theory right now. We're not really sure. <laughs> Does that help? No. <laughs> <laughs> so so I that is something. But what I'm looking to do is, and, and if you go back and look at some of the uh, long-lived tornadoes that cycle like this, that signature is there pretty commonly, but there's some that it's not. Uh, why? I don't know, I, but it is something that, that bears observing, I guess. Yeah, and if, if you had any rain in there, I guess that would totally kind of overwhelm that signal, wouldn't, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it would. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh-huh. Hi, Ken. It's Aaron. Uh, good, good talk, by the way. Um, just a couple, uh, I guess, questions or observations. Um, one thing on this event for us in Dodge that we found, I mean, we had several good debris balls as well, but in real time I didn't notice this, but going back and looking at uh, especially a lot of the dual pole products in association with these strong velocity couplets that we know had tornadoes, that Within about 20, 30 miles, given that we have kind of a lack of things for these tornadoes to hit, we would still see these very shallow, you know, mostly observable only on the half degree and only just maybe two, three range bends in width. Um, I don't want to call it a debris ball because it's not what it was, but you'd have this area of lowered CC right where the couplet was. Mm -hmm. And the best that 
we're, we're kind of thinking, and I haven't really cleared this for a lot of people, is that we may just be looking at very small particulate matter that's being lifted because you know, these tornadoes went beyond about 25, 30 miles. We couldn't see that anymore. Yet yeah. we know we had a continuous damage path, but they just never hit anything. It was mostly yeah. grass and, and smaller particulate matter. I was yeah. just curious if you had seen that well on this on this case because I actually saw that three or four times with uh, storms that were within, like I said, 20, 30 miles of the Dodge City radar. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the, only, the only time we saw it was one where, where a couple, I know what you're talking about because we saw that once or twice, and it was when something occurred rather close, like you were saying, in a rural area, basically west and north of the radar, which are the ones that got kind of the closest besides this one. But you're right, you can't really see it when you go away. And we were thinking it was like dust particulates or something like that, that it's really not hitting anything. It's just grabbing up a bunch of dirt and, or gravel or whatever it is that's out there and stirring it up. I mean, is that what you guys were thinking? Yeah, I mean, it's there now that we've seen it, um, you know, the forecasters kind of look for that stuff now, but... They're extremely subtle. I mean, rarely uh -huh. do you see any, you know, 50 dBZ or anything like that on the reflectivity, but they're there. And every time you'd get a storm that with a significant tornado, you'd see that signal. And then once it, like I said, got beyond about 25 miles, it'd just go below the horizon. But yeah. it, it's just kind of interesting thing that uh, we're kind of readjusting what uh, debris looks like on our radar where we yeah. have really nothing for it to hit. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is we notice that you know, when when it would start to weaken, you could almost see the the debris aloft just kind of centrifuge out. It was really we've seen that a couple times too, where you just get this large debris area just kind of goes out. That's you know you would think that you would see that in the real tight circulation, which you do to some degree, but when the circulation would start to die, it it would be like where everything just kind of gradually was just thrown out, and that was the end of it. So. Any more questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Ken. I think uh, what you showed also with the cycling is uh, important when we get these uh, long track uh, tornadoes. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and um, we'll see you next time. Okay, Bye -bye. thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.